The evil chamois Hagar is a carbon gravel bike that is currently sparking lots of discussions thanks to its unusually slack head tube angle, long and low top tube, ultra short stem and front wheel that sits well in front of the rider. I happen to know a thing or two about frame geometry, so in this masterclass we'll be using science to determine whether progressive frame geometries make any sense on gravel bikes. I'll be introducing you to some pretty advanced concepts which are going to tell us exactly when the Chamois Hagar's geometry will outperform other gravel bikes, along with when it will fall short. There is a lot of assumed knowledge in this video, so if you're a beginner, first check out my article about the basics of frame geometry, which is linked below. Also, if you're keen on getting yourself a bikepacking or touring bike, check out my buyer's guides which are linked below and teach you everything you need to know about the bikes along with how to compare more than 190 different models at the back of the books. The lion's share of Evil's marketing is that the Hagar is a single track capable gravel bike. With its unique frame geometry, Evil is signalling to you that when you buy their bike, you will not only speed along gravel roads, but you'll be able to confidently tackle single track like you would on your mountain bike. With 700c by 50mm tyre clearance, full fender mounts and 7 bottle cage mounts, the bike is also marketed towards people interested in bikepacking and commuting. The first thing we need to understand about the Hagar is that it's following a gravel bike trend where manufacturers are increasing the reach of their frames. These bikes have been designed to pair specifically with short stems, which are necessary in order to maintain the same distance to the bars. Longer top tubes are actually a great idea on gravel bikes because the longer overall wheelbase provides extra stability on rougher terrain, and the longer front centre provides extra toe clearance from the front wheel. The downside to long reach gravel bikes is that they have a front to rear weight bias that reduces the front grip in some situations. Here's what I mean by that. When we ride, a percentage of our body weight is distributed to the front and rear tyres. The typical rider has a centre of mass located around their hips when seated, which is almost exactly over the bottom bracket shell. Sudden accelerations while riding tip us forwards, not backwards, so that's why bicycles are always designed to put more weight on the rear tyre. If we make the front centre too short, we allocate too much weight to the front wheel, making it easy to go over the handlebars on steep gradients. When we have too little weight on the front wheel, the result is not enough front grip when cornering. So, how does the weight distribution of the Hagar compare to a typical gravel bike? When riding seated on flat surfaces on a typical gravel bike, around 59% of your body weight will end up on the rear tyre and the other 41% on the front. And the Hagar? Comparatively, it shifts between 0.8% and 3.3% of your body weight from your front tyre. This may not sound like a lot, but on flat corners or steep climbs, a couple of kilograms makes a big difference in terms of front grip. Yes, you can get some of this grip back by reducing the front tyre pressure, but ultimately it's the body weight on the front tyre that's needed most. Tall cyclists will find much less difference in front grip between the Hagar and a typical gravel bike. This is thanks to the steep 74 degree seat tube angle, which helps to bring more body weight to the front tyre. When standing up on the pedals, riders of all heights can expect the Hagar to offer similar levels of grip to a typical gravel bike. This is because, when standing, it's much easier to shift your body weight forward to the front tyre. Alright, let's look at a slightly different gravel bike design. The Rivendell Atlantis has the longest rear centre of any gravel bike that I know of, ranging from 515mm through to 555 The result is a bike with a similar wheelbase to the Hagar, but instead of the wheelbase length being extended in front of the rider, it's behind. Okay, so how do these long chainstays affect the weight distribution? The front tyre load on the Atlantis is substantially more in the smaller size bikes, but this reduces as the bikes get larger. You can expect an Atlantis to have far superior grip on flat and uphill terrain, but when the gradients pitch down, you will need to move your body weight behind the seat to get the equivalent front to rear grip balance of the Hagar. We've now established that, when seated, there is less front end grip on the Hagar compared to other gravel bikes. The thing is, this is a bicycle travel channel, so you better be out there carrying some gear. Bike packing handlebar packs, cargo cage bags and stem bags will put weight back on the front tyre. The question is, how much extra weight on the fork and bars is needed to match the front tyre grip of a typical gravel bike? 
If you weigh 60 kilos and ride a small chamois Hagar, you will need about 2 kilos on the bars to match the same front grip as a small Cannondale Topstone. This reduces to about 1.3 kilos if you are a taller and heavier rider, and if you're particularly tall and heavy, it's about 800 grams on the bars that will be needed to match the front grip of a Cannondale Topstone. Let's move on to the advantages of having that super long front centre. Basically, for anything steep and fast, you can expect the Hagar to absolutely bomb. This is for a few reasons. Number one, the longer overall wheelbase helps to make the bike steadier at speed as it lowers your centre of mass. Number two, when you stand up, your centre of mass is better centred between your tyres, maximising both front and rear tyre grip. Number three, on steep downhill roads and trails, you don't have to move your body as far back to centre your weight. And number four, the endo angle is increased, which minimises how easy it is to go over the bars. Wait, what's an endo angle? The endo angle determines how far you can pitch forward before hitting the tipping point. When we increase the front centre of the bike, we get larger endo angles that reduce the ability to go over the bars on steep terrain. A larger endo angle essentially gives you more confidence when you're heading downhill, especially after your front wheel hits a rock or some debris on the road. This is the number one factor that will make the Hagar a better single track descender than any other gravel bike available. At the other end of the bike, the looping angle determines how far you can pitch backwards before hitting the tipping point. More practically, a bike with a larger looping angle can ride up steeper terrain with more weight on the front tyre. There is actually not a huge difference between most gravel bikes as the chainstay lengths and seat tube angles are within quite a narrow range. But there are two ways to get bigger looping angles on gravel bikes. We can move the rider's centre of mass forward by steepening the seat tube angle, or we can fit longer chainstays to a bike. Shorter chainstays are usually preferred on both mountain and road bikes. They make a bike feel more nimble when making quick direction changes, for example, when riding in single track or when changing your position in a peloton. A particularly big advantage when cycling off-road is that short chainstays make your front wheel easier to lift over obstacles. Long chainstays, on the other hand, have significant advantages for gravel bikes. Firstly, they lower the centre of mass, making gravel bikes more stable at speed. They also increase the looping angle, allowing you to cycle up steeper gradients with more weight on that front tyre. Let's move on to steering speed. The product of the head tube angle and fork offset is the trail, and this is the measurement that will give us the best indication of how fast a bike will steer. Less trail equates to faster steering. This makes a bike more stable at low speeds because you can use the quick steering inputs to help you balance. However, at high speeds, these quick steering inputs will work against you as they make your bike feel a little less stable. More trail equates to slower steering. This makes a bike feel more stable at higher speeds because the steering inputs are less sensitive. At lower speeds, a high trail bike works out to be less stable because it has more wheel flop. In essence, good bike design requires the balancing of steering agility with bike stability. Too slow steering makes the bike difficult to turn. Too fast steering makes the bike unstable at speed. The Hagar is a high trail bike so the steering is substantially slower than a typical gravel bike. But despite its ultra-slack head tube angle, it's not extreme by any means. In fact, there are two extremely popular bikepacking bikes that have similar steering speeds, the Salsa Cutthroat and the Salsa Fargo. With the slowing effect of the wider tyres, these Salsa bikes actually work out to steer slower in practice. To increase its slow steering speed, the Hagar has been designed specifically around using a shorter stem. When we use smaller steering arcs, the handlebars become a touch more sensitive to steering inputs, which results in less effort required to change the direction of the bike. That said, the number one best way to improve the handling of a slow steering bike, especially if you're carrying any front luggage, is to increase the steering leverage. We can do this easily by installing a wider drop bar. Curved Bicycles specifically recommend their 600mm wide warmer drop bar with their new GMX bikepacking bike. If you want precise bike handling with bikepacking bags up front, a wide handlebar upgrade is going to be a must. We've now determined that the steering is slow but not totally unreasonable on the Hagar, 
But there is one more aspect of the steering, which is the biggest downside to a high trail bike. And that's the large wheel flop. This is the vertical distance the front axle lowers when the handlebars are turned. A bike with a large amount of wheel flop will, at low speeds, constantly want to pull your bars to the side while you ride, requiring extra effort to keep the bike in a straight line. With 60% more wheel flop than a typical gravel bike, the Hagar will undoubtedly be a bit of a handful on slow climbs. Then again, the Salsa Cutthroat and Fargo both have 50% more wheel flop than typical, and by most reports, they handle slow speeds just fine. The good news is that wider handlebars are the antidote to not only the slow steering speed of the Hagar, but they'll also reduce the effect of the wheel flop thanks to the additional steering leverage. So where are we at with the evil chamois Hagar? Well, it's not as wacky as it looks. The front to rear weight distribution has been optimised for descending, so the bike will be incredibly stable at high speeds, handling steep back road descents better than any other gravel bike available. On flat corners or steep climbs, this bike will require more work to maintain front tyre grip. In other words, you'll need to shift more of your body weight forward to get the equivalent grip. That said, when we factor in any luggage over the front wheel, you can expect no shortage of front end grip. The long front centre, slack head tube angle and long fork rake result in an endo angle that is significantly larger than most gravel bikes. This reduces the feeling of going over the handlebars, allowing you to ride more confidently on single track, especially when things get rough and or steep. Meanwhile, the looping angle up back is in line with other gravel bikes. The steering of the Hagar is very slow compared to a typical gravel bike. At low speeds, you can expect the handlebars to pull to the sides thanks to that high wheel flop, and this will be compounded with any front luggage. The short stem of the Hagar speeds the steering up a touch, but ultimately a wide handlebar with additional steering leverage is the best antidote to a high trail, high wheel flop bike. I know I'm jumping the gun here given I haven't even ridden the Hagar, but based on the fundamentals of bike handling, there are a few ways we can improve the steering and weight bias of this bike while still retaining the same downhill shreddability. Number one, more fork offset and less head tube angle. By tweaking these two values, we can achieve a similarly long front centre and similarly large endo angle, but with quicker steering and less wheel flop. To see this in practice, check out the Stooge Mark IV and Jones Plus long wheelbase. Number two, longer chainstays on the bigger frame sizes. By increasing the chainstay length and therefore looping angles, the Hagar will climb up steeper gradients with more grip on the front wheel. Number three, steeper seat tube angles on the smaller frame sizes. This would put more weight on the front wheel of the Hagar, helping to increase the front tyre grip when cornering seated. And number four, shorter reach on the smaller frame sizes. Along with the steeper seat tube angles, we could decrease the frame reach, which would allow a much better fit of the wider handlebars necessary to offset the slow steering speeds. If you like the sound of the Hagar, but not the cost, I'll let you in on a little secret. You can build a bike with a similar-ish geometry for a fraction of the cost. Actually, I'd argue this rig would handle even better for most bikepacking speeds and terrain, especially with luggage on the front. As you can see in the drawings, the Salsa Journeyman flat bar has a very similar overall geometry to the Hagar. At $949, you could get the bike, install a curve warmer handlebar and shorter stem for $170, then fit some Clara shifters for another $100, and there you go, a budget bike for quite literally 25% of the cost. I love that the Hagar offers something different to the norm, which gives us pause for thought about what actually constitutes a good gravel frame geometry. In the next few years, you can expect to see many more gravel bikes with a longer frame reach and shorter stem. I can't imagine we'll see many 66 degree head tube angles on other gravel bikes, but wider tyre models will likely settle on 68 or 69 degrees when paired with a longer fork rake. I really hope you've enjoyed nerding out today on the advanced frame geometry concepts that I've recently been working on. I'd love to make more of these videos, but they're super time consuming. So consider supporting my work on Patreon and I'll make sure to allocate more time and resources into teaching you all about bikes.